Hey guys, this is Phil, and in today's video, Jason will be showing us how to properly disassemble and reassemble a rear-wired version 2 Airsoft gearbox. Don't worry if your gearbox doesn't look exactly like Jason's, most of these tips and tricks will be universally applicable, so let's get to it. Once you have the gearbox shell taken out of the lower receiver, it will look like Jason's does now. The first thing you need to do is take off all the screws keeping the gearbox closed. You should loosen them all first before taking them off completely just in case the gearbox starts to pop open. It is extremely important to use the correct size Allen key or in some cases it will be a 2.0 Phillips head screwdriver. If you use the wrong size tool you will likely strip the screw which will severely complicate things for you. There's really no order in which you need to take off the screws. There is an order when closing up a gearbox but when opening one you don't need to worry about it. Instead, you should focus on keeping pressure on the shell right behind the cylinder. There is a lot of tension inside a gearbox and it can cause it to pop open if you're not careful. Also pay close attention to where you are putting the screws when you take them out, since you will need them again. Ideally, you should have a dish or a clean piece of tissue paper so that you can clearly see where you put them. When you finally get all the screws out, it is quite possible that your gearbox will not pop open on its own. That's what happened with Jason's, and that's totally okay. The next step is to insert a punch or screwdriver into the spring guide. You will hold this down so that when you pop the cover off, the spring guide doesn't shoot across the room. If the gearbox hasn't popped open, you can take a flathead screwdriver and gently start to pry it open a bit. Pay close attention to Jason's hand position. He has his left palm holding down the screwdriver that is inserted into the spring guide and is using his left index finger to keep pressure just behind the cylinder. As soon as he starts to pry, the front pops open, but he still has full control on the gearbox. You should continue to pry until your gearbox releases, which will generally make an audible click. Once that happens, you'll be ready to take the cover off. Putting a lot of downward pressure on the screwdriver that is inserted into the spring guide, gently start to lift the cover off. If it is not loose enough to come off yet, keep prying with a flathead screwdriver until you can easily and gently lift it off. You can either lift it up and out, or roll it over like Jason is doing. Either method is fine, but be very careful when you are putting it down that you don't drop it or otherwise disturb any shims that may be attached to the cover, as they need to go back exactly where they were. Once the cover is clear of the gearbox, place your finger on the cylinder, and with your other hand, using the screwdriver in the spring guide, point the spring guide downwards into the gearbox and slowly lift the spring out, keeping good tension and control until it is out completely. A good thing to do at this point is to place your gearbox on a clear piece of paper towel. This helps you keep your work area clean and is an easy way to ensure that everything that comes out of the gearbox is clearly visible. When you're ready, you can start to decompress some smaller springs inside your gearbox. Jason is using angled pliers and he starts off by removing the tapette plate spring. He hooks the spring and pulls forward to the front of the gearbox and then up which releases the spring. Once that spring is released, the whole cylinder portion can come out. Breaking it down, you have your tapette plate which moves the air nozzle back and forth with the gears and feeds your BBs from your magazines. The air nozzle has a little o-ring inside the lip which seals around your cylinder head. Then you have your piston, which is what actually compresses the air that our airsoft guns shoot. This particular piston is Jason's favorite. It is a lightweight SHS piston with metal teeth. It is extremely durable, very inexpensive, and is in almost every Storm Rider gun. You also have the cylinder, which can be ported or non-ported. Non-ported cylinders are used in airsoft guns with longer barrels. Ported cylinders will have a port along the side and the position of the port will depend on the length of the barrel, with longer barrels using a port closer to the rear edge. Finally, you have the cylinder head. We recommend using a metal cylinder head with a double o-ring for maximum air seal and using a sorbo pad. That is a black rubber pad that your piston head actually contacts with whenever your gearbox cycles. Having that in place dramatically reduces wear and tear on your gearbox. Using a sorbo pad can also fix your angle of engagement, which is the angle at which your gears actually engage with the piston. All the air seal parts you can see here are upgraded aftermarket parts. As a team, we feel that upgrading your air seal is one of the most essential upgrades because we wanted maximum consistency in our shots. This ensures that every time we aim our airsoft gun downrange, the BB will go where we expect it to. Now, for the lower half of the gearbox. For this part, Jason likes to draw three squares onto his paper towel and place each gear into a square. 
The most important part of removing the gears is to ensure that all the shims that belong to each gear follow them exactly. If your gearbox is already well shimmed, you need to make sure that the shims go back in the exact same order they came out in, otherwise you may need to reshim it. Shimming a gearbox could be a video all on its own and can be an extremely time-consuming process, so as a rule, it is better to take care to leave it the way that it is. You will also have the anti-reversal latch, which has a small spring that keeps it pushing upwards. This latch is easy to take out but can be a bit tricky to put back in later. It is generally advisable to keep an anti-reversal latch in your gun, even if you have an upgraded MOSFET or fire control chip that might let you remove it. Once that's done, the only thing left for Jason is his MOSFET. Jason's gun doesn't have a trigger unit and instead has a BTC Spectre MOSFET, which is a type of electronic trigger. In a stock gearbox, there would be a few other parts, including a trigger unit and a cutoff lever. When you pull your trigger, the trigger physically moves the trigger unit shuttle forward, creating an electrical contact, cycling your gearbox, and shooting a BB. The cutoff lever, which moves up and down via the selector plate, will either force the trigger shuttle to reset after every gearbox cycle, which is semi-auto, allow the trigger shuttle to stay in contact, which is full auto, or physically prevent it from moving, which is safe. When a stock airsoft gun is stuck in full auto, it's usually a problem with the trigger unit and the cutoff lever. Over time, the stock trigger contacts will also wear out and may need to be replaced. Upgrading your trigger unit to an electronic controller, such as a MOSFET, is a great way to reduce potential points of failure in your gearbox. Once you get the gearbox completely disassembled, you should give the gearbox shell a thorough cleaning. Quite likely the inside will be full of old grease and other debris, so take a clean piece of paper towel and really clean the inside until it shines. This will allow you to start fresh when you begin reassembly. If you are replacing any parts in your gun, you'll want to make sure they are ready at hand before you start reassembling. The first step for Jason is to replace his Spectre MOSFET. If you're using a conventional trigger assembly, you will also start here. Jason uses his big Phillips head screwdriver as opposed to a fine tip, even though the screw is small. This is to prevent the screw from stripping, which would be a big problem. He also makes sure not to over tighten the screw. Airsoft guns are not like pieces of heavy machinery. You don't need to torque down the screws too much. A quarter turn past finger tight is plenty. Once the trigger unit is in place, you'll want to run the wires to the motor and battery. Remember that since the battery wires will go past the motor, they should be run underneath the motor wires to prevent the motor from accidentally hooking them. After the wires, you should reinstall your trigger. This can be a little tricky since they can sometimes pop up because of the spring. Watch how Jason does it. First, he inserts the L part of the spring into the small hole on the trigger. Then he flips it over and pinches the spring and tip of the trigger to hold them together. Then he places the trigger in place, being careful not to damage any parts of his trigger unit. Sometimes you can push the spring with the tip of a flathead screwdriver to get it fitted in, but he can't do that due to his MOSFET. Instead, he inserts the trigger at an angle, puts it in the hole in the bottom, and rotates it until it slides into place. Once the trigger is in place, you might need to lay something on top of it to weigh it down, if it keeps popping up. You can use a screwdriver for this, but luckily Jason hasn't had to do it this time. The next step is to start lubricating the inside of the gearbox. Jason uses white lithium grease and applies a small amount around each gear bushing. The trick here is not to apply too much. Too much grease can build up in your gearbox and eventually cause extra resistance. You can then use your finger to smear the grease around. Make sure to grease both sides of the gearbox shell, again making sure not to use too much. You only need to apply grease around where the gears are going to sit. You don't need to apply grease anywhere else. Next up is replacing the gears. The first gear to go in is the spur gear, which is the largest gear, making sure you take any shims that went with it when you took it out. You can give it a quick spin to make sure there's no friction, and then apply a small amount of grease to the top of the gear where it will be contacting another gear. Then you place your sector gear, which is the gear that will be engaging your piston, again making sure you take any shims that went with it. The last gear you place is the bevel gear, which actually makes contact with your motor head. It can be a bit tricky due to the anti-reversal latch that we mentioned earlier. This latch prevents your gearbox from rotating backwards randomly, which can cause quite a lot of problems. It has a tiny spring which forces it up and into contact with the bevel gear, which has small ridges on the bottom that force it to only turn in one direction. What you need to do here is place the anti-reversal latch in first and hold it in the down position. You can then put the bevel gear in place, being mindful of your shims as always, and release the latch gently. 
From here, you can rotate your gears and see the function of the gearbox and the anti-reversal latch. Notice how it only allows your gearbox to turn in one direction. The challenge with the anti-reversal latch is that, because of the spring, it has a tendency to pop out of place randomly while you're working on the gearbox. If you have a tool that can hold it down, such as a pair of spring-loaded needle-nose tweezers, you can try to keep it in place. Otherwise, you'll have to be very conscious of the anti-reversal latch while you work. So now you have your trigger in place, your wires run, and your gears loop and in place. Next up are your air seal components, starting with your cylinder head. We recommend using some plumber's Teflon tape to cover the double o-ring. You want to try and keep it as close to the o-rings as possible, so you may have to fold a piece of Teflon over like Jason did. Jason then applies a very thin coat of synthetic lubricant with PTFE, commonly called gear grease, to the Teflon. This makes sure he has maximum air seal from his cylinder head. He then grabs his non-ported cylinder. Again, if you have a ported cylinder, make sure the port goes towards the back of your gearbox. Before you install the cylinder head, give the inside a quick cleaning. Inserting the cylinder head will be a tight fit. It needs to be tight to ensure maximum air seal. Keep pushing with your fingers and wiggling the cylinder head until the top of the cylinder is perfectly flush with the flat part of the cylinder head. Do not attempt to use a hammer or any other tool to get the cylinder head in place as you're likely to damage your air seal parts. You will also want to make sure that your piston head is in good shape. Jason's has an o-ring on it which he takes off and stretches out a bit. He also applies a bit of gear grease to it. O-rings that haven't been used or worked on in a while can shrink right up and cause a loss of air seal, so it's a good thing to watch out for. Once that's done, you'll want to test your air seal to make sure the compression is good. The best way to do this is to hold your cylinder in one hand while putting the thumb on the top of the cylinder head and then to insert the piston in the cylinder. If your air seal is good, it will only go so far in. If you're satisfied with the compression, you then need to replace the nozzle, taking care to put a tiny bit of grease on the tip of the cylinder. This helps lubricate the o-ring inside the nozzle. Rest the nozzle on the tappet plate and place the tappet spring on the bottom. You can then assemble the whole air seal components into your gearbox the same way Jason does. You'll need to make sure it's all properly seated in the gearbox. The cylinder head has two holes which will line up with a short pin on both sides of the gearbox, so you'll be able to see immediately if the cylinder head is properly positioned. Once everything is well aligned, take the works out and apply a small amount of gear grease to the grooves on the side of the piston, to the piston teeth, and to the small grooves on the inside of the gearbox. You should also take some lightweight 50 CPS silicone oil and put two or three drops inside the cylinder and use your finger to coat the inside. With your air seal parts and your gears properly in place, it's time to look at your angle of engagement, which is the angle at which your sector gear will engage the teeth on your piston. In this close-up, you can see how this works. Jason spins the sector gear until the first tooth on the sector gear connects with the piston teeth. In Jason's case, it's almost even, 90 degrees, which is what you want. This ensures that the sector gear pulls the piston straight back at a 90 degree angle perpendicular to your gearbox. If the angle is off, this can, at best, cause extra friction in your gearbox, but at worst it can damage your piston and gears. If you notice that your angle of engagement is off, a quick fix is often to apply a sorbo pad, as Jason showed us earlier. Additionally, you'll notice that some of Jason's piston teeth have been removed. This is also to ensure that the angle of engagement is perfect. You can buy pistons that already come this way, or you can use a metal file or dremel to carefully remove the teeth to achieve the same effect. Doing this yourself is pretty advanced, however, and we recommend you educate yourself thoroughly before attempting it. Finally, make sure that your sector gear is timed correctly, which simply means making sure that the little pin, or the delayer chip if it has one, is right up against the tappet plate. At this point, your gears and air seal parts are all set, so now you need to replace the tappet spring, using your angled pliers if you have them. This can be a bit tricky as the tappet plate will want to move, so keep good pressure on it, making sure you don't bump anything like your shims. The spring and spring guide will be the last things to put inside your gearbox before you close it, and just like when you were opening it up, you will want to be careful. Starting with the spring guide, you can see that Jason's is an upgraded one. It is all metal and has a rotating bearing plate on the back. This is very beneficial because as the spring gets compressed over and over, it will begin to turn and twist. That can cause additional strain on your gearbox and even contribute to shot inconsistency. Having a rotating bearing plate allows the spring to free spin, relieving that tension and staying straight. Jason's spring is an S110 spring, which is based on the FPS rating that he wants in his gun. Obviously, it's up to you to decide what spring you want in yours. So now it's time to close up the gearbox. First, you will insert your screwdriver into the back of the spring guide. 
Next, you will need to push the spring in. Jason gets a firm grasp on the front of his gearbox with his right hand, making sure to keep a lot of downwards pressure on the cylinder with his thumb. He then uses his right index finger to guide the spring into the piston. If you don't do this, the spring will have a tendency of wobbling around. You can see Jason struggle a bit with his spring, and the heavier the spring you're using, the more force you'll have to use. Keep pushing until the spring guide is in the gearbox, making sure the pin on the side is properly set into the gearbox shell. Keeping good downward force on the cylinder and spring, Jason now has control over the gearbox. It is important to keep force on the screwdriver for this next part. If you don't, it is extremely likely that the spring will shoot out of your gearbox like so. This can obviously be extremely dangerous, so don't try it at home. Now, to replace the gearbox cover, Jason uses his whole left hand to control the gearbox and grabs the cover with his right. He presses the screwdriver down into the table to keep the spring in place, and although it's difficult to see in the video, he pokes his right thumb through the cylinder hole in the cover and applies pressure with it onto the cylinder. Jason then places the cover on the gearbox and gets the spring guide locked in place. At this point, you can release the screwdriver, but your gearbox will not be completely closed. You're going to look through the top of the gearbox and make sure all your gears are aligned and all the way in the hole. Make sure no wires are pinched, ensure the trigger is locked in. For anything that isn't in place, insert a small screwdriver into the hole and wiggle the part around until it slides correctly in place and the gearbox closes completely. If your gearbox starts to pop open while you're working, it's not the end of the world. Reinsert the screwdriver into the spring guide, get control of the gearbox, and try again. Once your gearbox is completely flush and closed, you can start putting the screws back in. Unlike when opening it, you should place the screws back in in a particular order. For simplicity, Jason puts all the screws into the gearbox first without tightening them. This means he won't have to constantly go looking for them. Then he hand tightens the screws going around the shell. This is just hand tight and will help hold the gearbox closed while you work on it. They are not completely tight yet. As you can see, there's still a gap at the moment and that's okay. Unlike when you're opening the gearbox, where the order of screws doesn't matter, when torquing down the gearbox screws, you should try and follow a crisscross pattern, similar to when you're putting a new tire on your car. You also won't be torquing them all the way down at once. You will do it bit by bit until it's nice and snug. Jason starts with the bottom right screw behind the trigger, then directly across to the top, then the one under the cylinder, then back, and so on. Keep going until they are completely torqued down and the gearbox is completely closed. Take care to use the right size tool and apply consistent pressure to avoid stripping your gearbox shell screws. As we said at the start, stripping a screw will make your life way harder than it needs to be. And then you're done. Take a breath and do a final inspection. Make sure the nozzle moves and everything looks okay. Then you can start to reassemble your airsoft gun. Once you get your motor put in place, you may want to plug in a battery and test fire the gun, just to make sure it all sounds good before finalizing the reassembly. As you can see, we've sped up footage of Jason reassembling his. Every gun will be a little different, but just take your time and get it done. As we said at the start, this video is specific to rear wired version 2 gearboxes, but many of the tips and tricks will apply more universally. We hope you found this video helpful. Please feel free to leave any questions in the box below and we'll do our best to answer them. Thanks for watching.